and make sure what what is that name? How do you spell that name? Bjarne. B J A R N E. Okay. You got it. Okay. Let's roll them. Okay. Go on, go on. We're on. Okay. Good morning. Today is Monday, April eleventh, two thousand eleven. My name is Tony Hilliard, and with me is Phil Enslow. We're volunteers at the Atlanta History Center here today with Ronnie Rondom to record his experiences in, in Vietnam for the Library of Congress's uh, Veterans History Project. Welcome, Ronnie. Uh, could you state your full name, your address, and your date of birth, please? Uh, Ronnie Bjarne Rondom, or my date of birth is 15 July 1943. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your early, the early period of your life? I was born in Oslo, Norway, and uh, uh, as a Norwegian, Norwegian parents, grandparents, etc. Um, we lived in a fairly large house and, uh, that my grandfather owned, and uh, when he passed away, uh, my parents elected to uh, uh, emigrate to the United States following my paternal grandparents. And uh, we uh, came over in 1955, and uh, my dad came first, and he uh, get, uh, got a job as a, a bus driver for Greyhound Bus Lines. And so my mother and my sister and I came together, my sister being two years older. We came to Brooklyn, and where my paternal grandparents lived. We lived with them for approximately three, year, uh, three months, and then we moved to New Jersey, to Maplewood, New Jersey. Uh, there I went through sixth grade and uh, seventh grade. When we moved to New Hampshire and I went through high school in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, when I came to the United States, I knew two phrases in English. One was good night. The other one was just, a, just one moment, please. And I knew just one moment, please, because my dad worked for the uh, uh, military advisory group uh, for the uh, United States military in Oslo, and when someone called and I answered the telephone, and I did not understand a word that they said, I was to say, just one moment, please, and go and get one of my parents. That's interesting. So, so when um, I then started in sixth grade, uh, I knew very little uh, except what uh, that which I had learned in three months of riding the subways in New York and uh, sightseeing with, with my mother and uh, sister, and my sister was two years old, by the way. and. Um, she had had some English uh, instruction in the United States, I mean in, in Norway. And then uh, when I started, uh, the teacher on the, uh, was, uh, I don't know if I asked, my parents asked what was the best way to learn English, and she said, uh, get the biggest book you can find and get a good dictionary and read it, and every time you came to a word you didn't know, well I didn't know, um, look it up in the dictionary and write it down. I wrote down lots and lots of words, and I have absolutely no idea what the book was about, but it was uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. Uh, so that helped me greatly in learning in the English language. And she was uh, just a pearl of a, uh, of a teacher and a woman. Her name was Louise Arranges. Uh, when we moved to Manchester, New Hampshire, I, I skipped eighth grade to get back to my uh, chronological group. As, uh, when I came into, into New Jersey, they moved me down once so that I would be the oldest in school rather than the youngest in school. Um, so in New Hampshire, I went through high school. Um, I had a good time in high school, didn't get very good grades, but I had a good time. And uh, when I graduated, I, I had applied to a couple of uh, universities and I was accepted. Uh, one of them was uh, University of New Hampshire, the other one was Northeastern. And at Northeastern, I was supposed to go there on a hockey scholarship, even though I'd never played hockey in my life, uh, because uh, an alumni president had seen me skate, and I was a pretty good skater. Uh, but uh, I chose to go elsewhere, and I went in the Army. I enlisted in the Army in 1961, 28 July 1961. Went through um, <coughs> reception station and basic training at Fort Dix. And then I went to um, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, where I went through medic training. I was assigned to Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, outside El Paso, <coughs> to the uh, sixth uh, of the 62nd Hawk Missile Battalion that was scheduled to deploy to Germany that summer. And I had been there approximately, oh, uh, a, m 
month or thereabouts when I was called into the personnel section and was uh, told that uh, I could not, not go with them, I could not um, deploy because uh, I could, they, could, they could not get me a clearance because I was an alien. So they transferred me to the medical dental detachment at Fort Bliss and I be, uh, went to work in the uh, uh, immunization clinic, the shot clinic there. And uh, I became the ranking person as an E4 in there and became the NCUIC of the shot clinic. Uh, because the uh, Spec 5, uh, he ended up deploying with, you know, on regular deployment. He was in the Korea Army. Um, I went on to uh, uh, stay at uh, Fort Bliss for approximately, uh, uh, I guess it was about 16 months. Then I went to, uh, was transferred to Fort Rucker, Alabama. And at Fort Rucker, uh, again as a medic, I worked. Uh, at the airfields, uh, watching the helicopters go up and down, to, and in case it crashed, uh, I could be there to help them. Uh, I don't know if it was luckily for me or them, but none ever crashed. Um, and then I transferred later on uh, to the eye clinic there and worked in the eye clinic for, or a little bit over a year there, I guess, before I, I left. And when I left, I finished my enlistment on 27 July 61, uh, 64. Um, I drove out through the gate and I looked in a rear view mirror at the Fort Rucker sign and gave it uh, the Army and Fort Rucker the one fingered salute as I thought that was the end of my Army experience. Uh, I applied to a couple of universities on getting out. My parents at that point lived in New Jersey again. So I'd applied to Rutgers and Princeton. Uh, I was accepted to both. Uh, and if I'd known then what I knew now, I would have figured out a way to uh, make a go of it at Princeton. I didn't uh, know all of those things, so I went to Rutgers. Uh, after about uh, two-thirds of the way through the semester, I decided that uh, either the Rutgers wasn't ready for me or I wasn't ready for Rutgers. And uh, I left and re-enlisted in the Army with the express purpose of uh, going to OCS. Uh, it's a good thing. I've qualified and made it because I had enlisted, uh, re enlisted for six years in order to maximize my re-enlistment bonus. And of course back then the re-enlistment bonus was uh, times your base pay and my base pay as a, a E5 at, at the, that I was when I got out was oh, probably uh, 180 or thereabouts a month so that I, I got in excess of $600. Um, when I re-enlisted, they asked me where I wanted to go, the traditional Army uh, dream sheet, and I asked for uh, Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver, uh, Letterman's Hospital in San Francisco, or Fort MacArthur in Southern California. Uh, you had three choices. Uh, in the Army's wisdom, they sent me to uh, Puerto Rico, so sort of the other way. I was uh, there, I was assigned to the examining and induction station which was a fantastic opportunity for uh, goofing off and having a great time, which I did. But uh, I also ended up meeting uh, my uh, then-to-be uh, spouse. And uh, before I left there to go to OCS, uh, we were married. And uh, uh, I should backtrack a little bit and say that my dad took me to the airport on, uh, to go to Puerto Rico. And his last words when he, when he put me on the plane was, well, don't you come back with one then send your readers now. And of course, that's exactly what I did. Um, and uh, I went through infantry o OCS, uh, uh, got there in the fall of 65, graduated in March 66. Uh, this was at the real buildup for Vietnam. Uh, while we were in uh, OCS, we had the first um, Army person awarded the Medal of Honor, that was Roger Donlan, and he was uh, sort of our hero at that point. We all looked at him as a uh, you know, real big thing, and of course later on I, I, I was fortunate enough to meet him, uh, just a fantastic individual. Uh, upon graduation I was assigned to uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, to 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry, 196 Light Infantry Brigade, separate. And that unit was on orders to go to the um, Dominican Republic. Uh, it was a train and retain unit, 
which meant, meant that uh, the unit uh, cadre received their troops in, immediately from the reception station, put them through basic training, AIT, and uh, then their uh, advanced unit training. Uh, I arrived, as many of my OCS classmates, after they had finished their AIT and they were ready to get into more of the unit training. Uh, we completed a good part of that unit training at Camp Drum, New York, and now Fort Drum. And uh, that was in April and May, and uh, we, again, we were on orders for the Dominican Republic. Uh, I was a platoon leader of an anti-tank platoon, uh, which was uh, eight one of uh, six millimeter recoilless rifles mounted on Jeeps. The uh, which were very well suited to Dominican Republic. Uh, on the, our last training exercise, in the, uh, I think it was about the uh, 11th or 12th of May or thereabouts, uh, we had eight inches of snow at Camp Drum, you know, suitably qualifying us to go to the Dominican Republic. Uh, also showing a little bit of the Army spirit in our field training exercises, of course, we were supposed to train for air mobile and this kind of stuff. And, uh, but the Army was a little low on funds for a unit going to the Dominican Republic, so uh, a Huey was simulated with a three-quarter ton truck, and a Chinook was simulated by a deuce and a half. Uh, of course, they didn't, deuce and a half and three-quarter ton trucks didn't fly very high. But, so when they drive, drove by the ambush, we couldn't shoot at them because they were flying. Uh, so sort of interesting. But uh, anyway, uh, we got, came back to Fort Evans uh, around the end of May, and uh, fifth or the middle of June, our brigade commander, Colonel Francis Conaty, went to the Dominican Republic to uh, interact with the uh, person or the commander from the brigade of the 82nd that was down there, and uh, so to uh, coordinate uh, the replacement. And on the way back from Dominican Republic, he was told to stop by Washington, D.C., to the Department of the Army. He did, and at, uh, of course, and uh, at that point he was given a change in orders uh, from us going to the Dominican Republic to, uh, to going to Vietnam. And we had uh, uh, one month before deployment. So on the 15th of June, he came back and said, uh, Basically, to everyone, uh, you now take your deployment leaves and be ready to move out uh, no later than the 15th of July. Uh, so, all the various deployment leaves were arranged for. I had my uh, wife and our daughter up there at, uh, uh, outside uh, Fort Evans, and they went uh, back to Puerto Rico to live with uh, my wife's uh, parents. And. Uh, I stayed there to finish up. As I did not leave on 15th of July, I was with the rear detachment slash advance party. The main body left by boat from Boston went through the Panama, Panama Canal, made one stop in uh, Los Angeles Harbor, and uh, then went to Vietnam. That was a 30-day boat ride on very small Army troop ships. They had two troop ships, and uh, I heard, have heard all the horror stories about the, the that distance. But uh, anyway, I deployed on the 8th of, uh, 8th of uh, August by C-141 with uh, the rest of the rear detachment, and we stopped at, uh, uh, in Alaska at Elmendorf, and then we stopped again at uh, Yokota in Japan, and, uh, and uh, then we flew into Tansanut. And I remember us landing there late in the afternoon, early evening, and they trucked us to a place for us to spend the evening, which was, uh, uh, camp, they referred to it as Camp Redball. And Camp Redball was also a uh, holding area for uh, coffins. And many of the people in uh, on a, uh, our rear detachment slash advanced party actually spent their first night in Vietnam sleeping in coffins. I wasn't quite up to that. So uh, I, I just found me a nice place to lay down. Uh, the next morning we went by uh, uh, C-130s uh, 
uh, from Tansenut up to Tainan West, uh, Tainan Airstrip, and uh, that was outside the town of Tain, uh, city of Tainan, and it, it was an airstrip that had been built by the French, was still in operation, and uh, we set out from there to uh, uh, build our base camp. The area was uh, uh, protected by the uh, one of the Wolfhound battalions. I'm not sure which ones. Uh, First or the second of the 27th Infantry, from the 25th Infantry Division, and it, uh, they were mechanized. And they surrounded all uh, us while we were out there, uh, cut down tapioca uh, bushes and blew up ant hills, and basically tried to make it as flat as possible to, uh, so that we could uh, prepare for the troops coming in. Uh, we got tents up there and started getting those up, and I think we. Had most of the tents up when the unit actually landed on the 15th of Septem uh, September, I uh, correct, on the 15th of August at Vung Tau. And as the brigade came ashore, uh, the brigade commander, uh, Colonel Connerty, uh, was told that he would no longer be the brigade commander, that uh, he was relieved and they, uh, for no reason. Uh, but uh, they put in charge a uh, brand new uh, a brigadier general uh, called uh, 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 General Desassure, and he quickly gained the nickname General Death for sure by the troops. He was not a good leader, uh, not a good general, and uh, he was known, amongst other things, to be at the base camp directing traffic of convoys coming in from uh, uh, Long Bend and Saigon. Um, but anyway, he, he was the, the commander, and uh, my battalion commander was Colonel Weddell, and, my, and he was uh, an older gentleman. He looked a lot older than he was, uh, and his command sergeant major was one of the first sergeant majors in the Army, Command Sergeant Major Black. Um, they were both decent individuals. Command Sergeant Major was a better sergeant major than the battalion commander was a battalion commander. Um, in fact, the command sergeant major, when I reported in, had myself and two other lieutenants uh, in the anteroom waiting for the CDO man. And uh, command sergeant major Black asked if he could have a few words with us, and we said sure. And he uh, pr proceeded to tell us that uh, in his battalion, all second lieutenants and below belong to him. Well, it, having been prior enlisted, I sort of understood that that might not be a bad thing. And the other two lieutenants sort of looked at each other a little questioningly. But the way that worked, when uh, the, the battalion commander came out to see the various platoons, etc., the command sergeant major, if he he liked you and you went along with his story, uh, he would hurry up up over to see the lieutenant and let the battalion commander see the platoon sergeant. And then the uh, sergeant major would tell the lieutenant uh, what the battalion commander was looking for that day, so you'd be prepared to answer the questions, and that you could uh, uh, show that you looked like you knew what you were doing. And so he was very good to work with. Uh, the uh, uh, battalion commander was changed. Uh, I want to say after about five months in country, it might be B six, but I think it was uh, less than that. And that was a uh, we went from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Weddell uh, to uh, uh, Major Promotable Steve Nichols. And uh, Steve Nichols had been an executive officer of a battalion in the 173rd Airborne. And he was a young hard charger. And uh, he was just a very, very fine uh, battalion commander. Uh, he ended up retiring as a uh, Major General, uh, Colonel Weddell ended up retiring as a, a full colonel of six, which also showed a little bit of the difference between the two. Uh, of interest also in, in the brigade, we had uh, our ex brigade executive officer was a Colonel Charles Murray. Uh, colonel Murray was a Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. I never got to meet him while I was in the brigade, but I did get to meet him when, during a, when he came in here with the Medal of Honor Foundation, and we shared some uh, good memories. My uh, company commander was uh, Captain Art Lorca, and, and 
and I was, again, the anti-tank platoon leader assigned to Delta Company, and uh, he was also a, a fine individual, a good leader. And the tradition in Vietnam, and it carried through, as far as I know, through the length of the war with the Army, uh, the officers and senior NCOs, where possible, they spent six months in the field, so to speak, and then it was changed to six months in some kind of a, a less threatening job or a, a staff job kind of thing. Seeing that I had an anti-tank platoon and I didn't have a rifle platoon, uh, I had a non-threatening job to start with. Uh, even though after I'd been there for four months, I was told that we don't know what to do with you as an anti-tank platoon. So I then was t given the mission of changing my uh, anti-tank platoon to be become a rifle platoon. So uh, I spent a, f a full year as platoon leader, first with the anti-tank platoon, then with a rifle platoon. Um, when I changed to the uh, uh, rifle platoon, I went from Delta Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry, to uh, Charlie Company, 2nd um, Battalion, 1st Infantry. And uh, my company commander there was Captain Rowell, and he was an OCS grad who had spent 14 years enlisted, all in administrative type positions. And the, his company command it was the first time that he had served in any uh, capacity at uh, below brigade level. He was not a good company commander, um, uh, not a good person to serve with, uh, under during, uh, during that time. Uh, did serve with a lot of good people, uh, had a lot of good, interesting experiences on the first tour. The, uh, we stayed in Tainan for, uh, from August until April, and in April we, we moved the whole unit to July, uh, and that was a real big secret because we were all brought in, the officers and senior NCOs, to the uh, battalion briefing and said, you know, you can't say this even to your troops until X date. And that afternoon we went into Tainan for something or other and had big banners over the street saying, Goodbye 196. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah. So uh, we, we moved up to July, but be, before July, a couple of other things. Uh, while I had an anti tank platoon, our main uh, functions were normally to protect something, either the perimeter around our main base camp or going out and protecting artillery batteries. Um, around base camp, uh, there was a little bit of village uh, close to our section of the perimeter. And uh, we would fairly routinely get shots fired from that village, sort of just haphazard into the uh, whole brigade perimeter. And we referred to it as a one-shot Charlie. And each time we were, of course, requested permission to return fire. Well, that request had to go from the, the perimeter up to battalion tactical operations center, the TOC, and to brigade TOC. Then they had to coordinate with the, region, the Vietnamese headquarters and get approval before we get it back down. Of course, by the time that came back down, that might be two or three hours, and the threat had gone away. Um, However, when we got the change to uh, Major Nichols as battalion commander, one of the first nights that uh, I guess he was uh, the commander, and uh, I happened to be out on the perimeter with my platoon, and they had uh, we had a shot from the village, and uh, the individual at that bunker called the battalion talk, and Major Nichols was in the talk, and he said, "Go ahead and fire," and we fired one main round, one of six. Uh, in, into that village, and we didn't have any more shots from that village after that. That's sort of the way things go. Um, we deployed uh, quite a bit uh, into War Zone C uh, with the uh, rifle platoon as well as with my anti tank platoon. Uh, one of the other places that, uh, uh, or the two main places that uh, we supported firing batteries, one was at a old French fort, which was located next to a civilian irregular defense group a training center uh, north of Tainan. And uh, uh, 
that's where I was located during the first major uh, combat action that the brigade was in, or our battalion specifically was in. That was Operation Attleboro, <coughs> and uh, that was costly both uh, for us, for the 196th, and for the uh, 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 Viet Cong force that, that attacked. Uh, we had apparently found, stumbled upon, or, or intelligence directed us to, a fairly large cache of uh, uh, rice and weapons, etc. Sort of uh, southeast of uh, Tainan, <coughs> and uh, the uh, regiment came to protect it and got into a large firefight. Uh, there was, uh, uh, or I and I, I listened to the whole sequence in the tactical op operations center of the uh, special forces that uh, had the uh, CIDG training center, and they had a almost a mercenary force called the Mike Force that the uh, uh, Special Forces ran were, for, were first overran by the uh, uh, Viet Cong Regiment and then they came uh, down and, and hit uh, our battalion and our brigade and it was reinforced by units from the 25th uh, Division, etc. And that, that became a pretty big action. Uh, the after action reports of that uh, gives almost all the credit to a, a major from the 25th and to units of the 25th. However, they suffered very few casualties and had very little actual action on it. And 196 was one who deserved the, the vast majority of it. Uh, most of the operations that were conducted back then, and this was in 66, early 67, it was uh, brigade and division sized search and destroy operations where they almost, you know, they went on line through the jungle and tried to move the defenders towards a blocking position where uh, that would be, uh, uh, hopefully they'd, they'd catch the folks, uh, the bad guys. Uh, that resulted in catching very few people and uh, not really doing a heck of a lot. One of the memorable occasions was when the, the, uh, we had uh, roughly three brigades out in the middle of Warsaw Sea that protected a large area that was the com for the combat jump, quote unquote, that the 173rd Airborne Brigade got their Bronze Star on their jump wings for in Vietnam. Uh, that was their combat jump, and the DZ was only protected by three brigades. Um, but it was Operation uh, Cedar Falls, Operation Junction City. Uh, were two of the, the larger operations that were conducted before we deployed to Chulai. Uh, when we arrived in Chulai, we were set up as perimeter security around Chulai Air Base, replacing the uh, 3rd Marine Division that had been in that area, uh, who had been given the task of walking to Da Nang and basically clearing all the area between there. I have a high regard for the Marines in most areas, but the, the uh, platoon position that I, I took over from a Marine lieutenant was the worst kept uh, unit uh, position I had ever seen in my life, and I have ever seen since, uh, regretfully, especially seeing that you happen to be a Marine Army. <coughs> but we got along with uh, all the Marines up there and all the Navy people had a lot of good times. You could stand on the beach at July and look out uh, on the South China Sea and uh, you could think that you were at any resort in the world. Beautiful white sandy beaches. Uh, and uh, some worse, I think I even have a picture of one of my pl pl fellow uh, uh, lieutenants standing beside a signpost with uh, mileage and directions uh, for going to uh, places like uh, San Francisco and Honolulu and wherever else. Uh, and all you can see in the background is beautiful white sand and, and the sea. Uh, while in July we did not have that many uh, operations as our primary uh, task was to provide security for the air base for the Marine Air Group that was there. Uh, we also had a helicopter unit that uh, had come up with us with the 71st uh, uh, Army Aviation uh, I guess battalion, and uh, 
and they had been with us at, uh, in support of it, so our support at uh, Tainan as well, and they moved up there with us. Uh, we got to know uh, them better, uh, and we got to know the Marine uh, group better because they had officers clubs and we didn't, and we would sort of wander over there at night. Uh, but we also had, uh, uh, oh, I had one memorable experience while I was up there, and it's uh, combat related. We were on a uh, I guess you'd call it the search to destroy, and uh, uh, I fell into a punchy pit, and uh, I was able to catch myself before I got to the punches with one arm on each side of the hole, holding myself up while punchy stakes were basically pushing up on my crotch, and if I'd let go of my hands, the punchy stakes would have been in places I didn't want to. Short answer, and my RTO. It helped me out of there, and that, that was uh, a very memorable experience. Um, and I'm uh, going to uh, trace back a little bit back to uh, uh, in Tainan area. Well, we found a, a, a two of uh, things stories from out there. We found a village that uh, had been by uh, more of a Cambodian. Uh, group of people than the Vietnamese, but uh, they had a lot of chickens running around, and uh, all the stoves, etc., were still hot and on, so they had ran out of there just before we got there. But with the chickens running around, the um, uh, company commander, uh, Captain Rao, decided to have a chicken shoot, and I happened to be on R&R &R when this happened, but uh, I heard the story shortly after I got back. Uh, he had uh, pe people shooting at the chickens with M16s, the troops were, and of course they're getting most of them. Well, Captain Rowell didn't have an M16, he had a 45, so he decided he was going to try to get them. So he aimed once and went, missed, missed. Well, third try, he took a good spot load with a 45. Um, when I came, came back off R&R, &R, the medic was attending to his carry around his eye. Uh, for those who don't know, that, that a 45 has the sly kicks back when you shoot, and uh, anyone who knows anything about a weapon does not take a spot well with a 45. Uh, that was uh, an, an administrative officer out in the field. Uh, also, uh, at that time, um, uh, one of my fellow uh, platoon leaders, Jerry Ford, uh, was going through the jungle with his platoon. And he was, in a, we felt like it wasn't a real serious area. So he was trying some new uh, kids out on point and slack. So they haven't gone through basic training and AIT were real well versed in what you're supposed to do. So in the middle of War Zone C, the point man sees a wire. So he tells the slack guy behind him, look out for the wire and steps over it. And the slack guy looks at it and says, look out for the wire, steps over it. The third guy, it was, I don't know if he's a squad leader or a team leader, but he followed the wire with his eyes, and here's Viet Cong Charlie sitting over there trying to set off his claymore. And of course, Viet Cong didn't live to set off the claymore, and the claymore didn't go off. But it just shows that some training you don't adhere to quite as well as you should. You're better off not listening to those kinds of things. Um, but in uh, July, uh, we, we were set up, what the Marines told us uh, was referred to as Route 22, and that was the area that was, went around the perimeter. Uh, we also had uh, a, a responsibility uh, on a re rotating basis for an island uh, off July called the Kulare, where they had a tropo site, which is a communication site set up. And uh, we would have a squad uh, to go out there ever so often to guard them. And that was like a, uh, uh, about a two to three hour uh, LST ride east direction. And uh, you bought enough uh, beer and fishing poles to have a good time going in both directions. And that island also had an old French uh, airstrip built on it and had uh, uh, fortifications uh, uh, against the Japanese, actually. And uh, 
that island uh, was a known uh, VC on our site, and they didn't attack the tropo site, and we didn't attack them, and uh, probably worked out real well for both sides. A real rich farming community, uh, well off, was a, a good time to go out there. We enjoyed that. Uh, also in uh, July, we uh, were able to, uh, uh, like I said, go to the officers' club of the uh, the uh, uh, Marine Air Group, and there uh, we taught them how to become bayonet qualified, and they taught us how to become carrier qualified. Uh, both very interesting experiences, and for those who uh, may watch this in the future, I'll be glad to explain that to you separately. Okay, let's see where we are and all this stuff. Do you want to take a break? Um, no, I think I'm good. Okay, um, we'll get some glass of water. Yeah, that'd be good. Oh, Just stop and film like in a minute. You were, uh, where were we? Well, you just been talking about getting qualified by the Marines. Oh, that, uh, okay. uh, oh yeah, okay. care qual and being that qual. Okay. So are we on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and at this time, I, I'm still with C Company, and I'm a platoon leader with a rifle platoon under uh, Captain uh, Rao. And uh, around June is when our pe people started uh, looking at leaving us. Most of our, the people have come. Uh, over with the boat, and they left uh, on on or about 15 July. Was their uh, DROs or uh, departure? For, I don't know. I don't need, uh, It's date for estimated return from overseas. Mm -hmm. Nothing stands for. Uh, so they were going back about that time. Well, I couldn't go back until August because I came over later. Their term uh, time on the boat counted. My time on the airplane did too, but uh, it's a lot shorter time. Uh, the, we got a new company commander uh, that I really don't even know, remember the name of. Uh, our officers turned over for the most part, <coughs> although uh, many of them were still from the original group. Uh, and same with our NCOs and uh, troops. Uh, and, and my replacement actually came in shortly after the 15th of July. So I could have left any time thereafter, especially once I trained him. But my new company commander apparently felt like that wasn't the right thing to do. So he kept me on there until the, uh, around, I think I, I left July around the uh, uh, 3rd or 4th of August, heading south. Uh, so the last several weeks I was there, I had absolutely nothing to do. Uh, I did a one really not bright thing. I went over and visited the uh, 71st Aviation Company, the uh, Rattlers, and uh, spent some time at their club uh, as well. But then uh, they asked me one morning, uh, hey, you want to go, go for a supply ride? I said, sure. So I went up and went on uh, a su supposed supply run with them. And sure enough, the first one was indeed a, a supply run. We went in there and dropped off whatever supplies we were supposed to and came back out and picked up some more stuff and went in for uh, going to go for the second one. And en route uh, was the only time that I've ever, ever piloted a helicopter. And they had me sitting in the, the right seat of the UE. And the uh, uh, the ac actual right seat guys were sitting in the back. And the left seat guy said, uh, Tell me in my headsets, uh, have you operated a helicopter? I said, no. He said, well, you, you put your hands on, on the, uh, the sticks, and then you put your feet on the pedals, and then you start moving them around and get feel for it. I said, can you feel that? I said, yes. He said, good, As, because I, I got my feet off. And he had his hands behind his back and his feet up like this and said, you got it. And we're at 1,500 feet. Uh, so I played with that for a little while until he apparently thought I was going to do an air stall and then he resumed uh, operation of it. Uh, obviously that was not dangerous. You know, he, he was in full control. Uh, however, when we did go to uh, deliver the supplies, we went in on a hot LZ. And I have less than two weeks left in the country and I'm on a hot LZ. Uh, that's not smart. So, but luckily, in, in no one on 
uh, board the aircraft were hurt, injured, hit, whatever, nor was the aircraft hit. And we came out of there. And I left um, by uh, uh, the old uh, Freedom Bird, as we called it back then, and uh, landed at uh, Travis Air Force Base and uh, went through San Francisco. And I was one of those who got spat upon in San Francisco. Uh, I had somebody with me who uh, restrained me from going after the, the, the individual, but uh, got, got on the plane, um, uh, flew to New Jersey, then to Puerto Rico, and my new assignment was in uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, and I was the company commander there of uh, B Company, 2nd Battalion, 10th Infantry, and of the 5th Infantry Division. And, uh, that was a, a mechanized company, mechanized infantry company, and uh, I, it was one of my most enjoyable command experiences uh, on one sense in that I'd never had mechanized command, learned a lot of new things, uh, worked for some really fine people and with some really fine people. And my battalion commander was a, a man named Bill Agro, who had been the uh, G2 with the 1st Infantry Division under General Dupuy. And uh, one of my uh, fellow company commanders, a company commander, was uh, Larry Wissell, who uh, had a tour with the 101st. Uh, the C company commander was uh, Lance Patterson, who had uh, had a tour with the 173rd. So just a lot of really, really fine people that I worked with and for. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I was best man out there to uh, one of the officers in the, uh, with headquarters company, Bob Dunning, who retired as lieutenant colonel, and also to one of my lieutenants, uh, Nick Harding, and uh, I have no idea where he, he is or what's become of him. I still keep in touch with Bob. Um, and uh, we had a challenge out there, however, because the Army was in such a flux that uh, units like mine either had uh, people coming out of uh, basic and AIT who was being prepared to go to Vietnam, and then you had the people who were coming back from Vietnam just waiting until their release date, who really didn't give a, uh, give a damn about the Army or doing anything. Uh, you, in between you had uh, uh, some NCOs, career NCOs, that did their best to keep things going, and your lieutenants were almost all um, out of OCS or uh, ROTC on their way to Vietnam. Um, a mechanized company normally has uh, uh, four lieutenants, uh, platoon leaders, and, a, and an XO. Uh, XO is normally first lieutenant. Uh, for quite a while, uh, I had 11 second lieutenants. And I had, at that point, I probably did not have uh, more than 110 tr uh, troops in the unit. So, how do you train a second lieutenant? to go into combat when you can't give them a platoon. And uh, that became uh, a very uh, strong challenge. Uh, we had to rotate the lieutenants to be platoon leaders. We tried to give them uh, additional jobs that were somewhat meaningful. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of those lieutenants made it through. Uh, I don't know how they did, but it, uh, the quality of the lieutenants that we at that point received from OCS uh, had gone down quite a bit in that uh, when I went through in finishing in 66, we had one battalion graduating um, lieutenants out of OCS. Uh, by the time 68 came around, 67, 68 came around, you had three if not four battalions graduating lieutenants out of OCS and they were pushing them out pretty quick. Um, so that was a huge challenge. The other challenge was we didn't have a, a lot of uh, training time devoted to real platoon training because a big challenge that uh, we as a country had were the uh, uh, anti-war sentiments and uh, that required us to do lots of uh, ride control training. Uh, we were deployed to Chicago uh, in response to the uh, Martin Luther King assassination. Uh, I did not actually go with the unit then, but we went 
later on also deployed to Chicago with the, uh, for the Democratic National Convention, and I did go with that. Uh, on the first one, sort of actually humor, a uh, little humor in there, in that having had all these uh, training times, restriction times to where you couldn't go, you had to stay around. I finally got a three-day pass from my, my battalion commander to take my, my wife and uh, child to uh, uh, Chicago to see their my sister-in-law. That's my wife and daughter was going to go to Puerto Rico to see her parents. And uh, I drove from Chicago to, uh, I mean from uh, Fort Carson to Chicago, leaving at Friday morning at 0001 kind of thing, and got to Chicago that late that afternoon. Uh, we went, and we, we sat up and talked that evening. Next morning, my brother-in-law was going to take me out and show me around the area, and they lived out in the North Riverside area. And uh, when we came back, my wife was out on the uh, stoop of the, the uh, apartment and waving her hands and uh, yelling and screaming that I had to call back to my company real quick, which I did, and found out that we were on alert to deploy. And um, I said, well, do I need to fly back or drive? And I said, I don't know. You better call the battalion commander, which I did. And the battalion commander said, oh, go ahead and drive. Well, apparently, when I was driving back, they were flying overhead, and we crossed uh, there. So when I got back to Fort Carson, I was uh, rear detachment commander, while all my troops were in, in Chicago losing the money to the Chicago policemen playing poker. Uh, so that, that was so interesting time. But I, I did get to uh, uh, do a fair amount of skiing while I was out there. Uh, but even on one of my ski trips, I went with my ex executive officer, Joe Brown. We went down to Taos, New Mexico. And as we came to the lift uh, on early Sunday morning, we uh, were intending to go back Sunday evening, but there was a big uh, a deal on the sign, uh, Captain Ron, please call your company. So I called, and sure enough, we were being deployed again. That was when we were going to be deployed for the Democratic National Convention. Uh, no, that was not one of the one it was for, it, but it, w it was for an alert that I had to go back for, because uh, the Democratic National Convention wasn't in the snow in town, so that was in August. Um, I stayed as company commander until, uh, well, I guess probably uh, October, when I became the S-4 for a month and a half before I uh, had orders to go to Vietnam, and I had orders to go to the 101st Airborne Division. In, uh, I took my deployment leave, went to Puerto Rico, took uh, hops back to uh, the West Coast, uh, left from Travis again, um, and got to um, uh, land uh, at, at Thompson uh, went to uh, Long Bend Replacement Detachment up there, stayed there for a couple of days. They uh, sent me over to what they were, uh, for to Screen Eagle Replacement Training School, CERTS which was uh, also at uh, Benoit. And when was this? That was in uh, December 8, 1968, okay. um, that I landed. And um, uh, that, that was uh, a re requirement for all, uh, all one of first uh, people co or coming into the one at first, you had to go through their replacement training school. Unless you had pr prior tours over there, then uh, you just sort of looked at it a little while and went on to your unit. And uh, I was, I stayed there, I think maybe three days or so. And then I was uh, sent north to uh, Camp Evans, uh, which was uh, in northern I Corps, north of Way. And, uh, that was the home of the 3rd Brigade for the 101st. The 101st had uh, three uh, big fire bases or cantonment areas almost up there, and then uh, Camp Eagle, where the division headquarters and 1st Brigade was located, uh, Elsie's Sally, which is where 2nd Brigade was located, and then Camp Evans, where 3rd Brigade was located, and that was south to north. Um, the, when I came into 3rd Brigade, 
uh, uh, the uh, brigadist, one was uh, Major Burroughs, and he asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, I want to be a company commander. And he said, well, we don't have any company command slots open, but uh, this is where you're going. And uh, so I went to 2nd Battalion, 506 Infantry, and I became the uh, S-1 coming in there. And uh, the brigade commander at that point was uh, Colonel uh, Joseph Conley, uh, who gained some fame as uh, being head of the old guard uh, when uh, Kennedy was killed, assassinated, and Johnson uh, uh, was uh, well, became president. Uh, the uh, uh, I, I came down to the uh, second and five or sixth, and the. Uh, Brigade commander then, or correction, battalion commander then was John Childs, um, somewhat uh, older gentleman in, in my view at that that point, but uh, pretty good uh, battalion commander. And uh, I got to, to know the uh, various uh, company commanders and staff, and uh, the uh, battalion executive officer that I worked for was Major Charlie Burns who was uh, what I would politely call a screamer. Um, and he and I uh, initially did not get along at all. Uh, I learned how to sort of uh, work with him to become effective, and I thought I did a pretty decent job at it. Um, one of my interesting uh, people working for me in the S-1 shop was my awards and decorations clerk. Um, his last name was Blaise Stell. He was a Spec 4. And uh, Specialist Blaise Stell had a degree in chemistry. Uh, B.S. may even have had an M.S. He was from the uh, family that uh, owned Zip Zippo Manufacturing for the lighters. And uh, so he came from some money. Uh, but he was and very interesting in a way he would do his awards or the write-ups for them. You, as a company commander out in the field, you do not have time to actually write the awards for the people that do things that they should be doing for you. Uh, and you probably do not get very much involved in it unless it's at least at the Silver Star level. Um, so the company commander, after some kind of action, would normally call in on the logistics net and he would say, I want a Ron Star V for line number 7, 82, and 19. And a, Archon V for the same kind of a thing. And uh, Blaise Dell would take down the information. He would then go and get the log for the operations and, and intel, and he would look, put them over a map and sort of work out what the probable action was, and he'd write it up. And he intended to go back, uh, but I don't think he did, but he was intending to go back and write a book, and he was going to uh, title it. I, I told it like it wasn't. Uh, but he, 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 a real sharp guy, a real bright guy. Uh, the battalion com commander after Colonel Charles was Colonel Gene T. Sharon, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, somewhat in the same mold as uh, my company commander for the first tour, Colonel Rival. Uh, hadn't had much in the way of uh, infantry experience. His job before he came to us was as uh, uh, charge of Project Count at Long Bend, counting uh, or actually uh, detailing all the uh, units that they actually had in country because what they had at Long Bend, no one really knew at that point. So they would move. They moved from one place in Long Bend to another place in Long Bend, and each when they moved it, they actually started cataloging what they had, and that was his job. Um, each battalion commander was uh, had their opportunity to come up with their own call sign. Uh, uh, Colonel Sharon was from Florida, and his call sign was Alligator, uh, which was fine. Uh, he tried to be a very troop-oriented battalion commander. He just wasn't. Um, he was uh, uh, one of the jobs that he gave me as uh, as the S one was when he went to the field, which wasn't real often, but he did. Uh, I had to uh, talk to him on tele uh, on the uh, radio, on the log net, uh, and 
after I talked to him on the log net, I had to go back and write a letter to his wife on, on his behalf, telling her that he was okay. So I ended up having a dialogue with her off and on for the time that I was the battalion S1. Uh, in, uh, I guess it was around April or thereabouts, she asked me uh, uh, which company I wanted. And uh, knowing the company's performance at that point in time, I picked Bravo Company, uh, second battalion, 506 Airborne. And, uh, I, I assumed command from um, Captain Cecil Warren Kealahua a, uh, um, of Hawaiian extraction. We referred to him as Captain K, as did all the troops. A uh, real fine man. Uh, the other company commanders that had been there about the same time were Captain Jeffcoat at Charlie Company, and Captain Jeffcoat uh, had, had later went on to. Uh, Amongst other things, uh, as lieutenant colonel, he commanded the uh, task force that had uh, they went to the Sinai as a peacekeeping force. And when they came back from Sinai, they crashed at Gander, and everyone on board was killed. Uh, still remember him as a, just a very fine officer. Uh, Captain K, I still keep in touch with, and he retired as a, a full colonel. Uh, the, uh, I guess it was A Company commander, was Captain Patrick Graves, uh, who is, uh, I've been in touch with recently, and he was a, uh, he, he is now a, a retired lawyer in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, Captain Felder was the S4, who ended up taking over A Company. And he was, uh, he is now in Tampa, Florida, his retired as colonel. Um, and the uh, uh, Captain McMahon had, was the S-5 and became the Delta Company commander. Um, Captain Jim Roach came in and later on became the Delta Company commander while I was there. And I still keep in touch with him, he's retired colonel. And he refers to himself uh, because he was ranger company command or ranger uh, uh, instructor for quite a while at uh, Delonica uh, as Ranger Roach, and most people know him as Ranger Roach. Uh, Captain Jim Womble had a, had a company before Captain Felder, and he retired in uh, Columbus, Georgia, and I've been in touch with him a couple of times. Uh, so a lot of these people I've kept in touch with, as well as my troops. Uh, when, when I, I assumed command in April, uh, we initially operated in the uh, Sandy Plains, the, uh, between the Piedmont and the South China Sea, along a lot of what is uh, correctly called the Street Without Joy from the French uh, book by the French. And uh, not a lot of uh, tough acts. We ran into booby traps, we ran into a few snipers now and then, but not a lot of action. Uh, the uh, brigade as a whole, well really the, the division, but specifically our brigade, was uh, then tasked to go into the Asha Valley. And there were, uh, was a road built in preparation for that. There were fire bases that were built further in on a regular basis uh, to move more in um, uh, towards at that point. And uh, the Asha Valley is, uh, I think the uh, level of the valley is like 300 meters, uh, two to 300 meters above sea level. Uh, on both sides of the, the valley, it goes up in excess of 1,700 meters. So it's over a mile high on each side of the valley. Uh, it's very mountainous. It's a beautiful terrain, but again, very mountainous. The uh, infamous battle is, uh, of the area is uh, Hamburger Hill, and that was on a hill about uh, two to three hundred meters above the uh, uh, floor of the valley. Uh, we could see and saw a good part of the action for Hamburger Hill from our fire base airborne, which was uh, on the uh, eastern side of the mountain, or eastern side of the valley. Uh, the, uh, we 
we also saw the B-52s do their strikes, uh, what's called arc lights, into the valley, and we could see the b if We would know when they were coming, and we would sit out there and watch them. We could see them going over, and we could see the bombs dropping, and we could feel the ground shaking at our fire base, and we would be you know, six to eight miles away or more, and we'd still feel it. Uh, the strange thing is that even after that kind of a bombardment uh, over any kind of a Viet Cong area, or North Vietnamese area, uh, people, the soldiers would come out of their foxholes still alive. And it's, it's just unbelievable that they could live through that. Um, uh, while in the Asha Valley, uh, I had the, the worst mission that I've had in the Army uh, or of anything that I've ever had to do in my life. Uh, we were given the mission to um, de uh, develop or find and then uh, make a landing zones out of the jungle. Uh, we started uh, first, uh, or before we got the mission, we had actually uh, walked up uh, from Firebase Airborne on the eastern side of the valley to over a mile high, uh, very close to uh, Eagle's Nest. Uh, was the uh, uh, small fire base up there. And then we walked back down past fire base airborne, and then we were given a mission to be airlifted uh, on an air assault to the western side of the valley. We did. Uh, didn't get in until, uh, we didn't land until it was dark out with the last choppers that uh, let my troops off. And uh, uh, we had no more than set up for the night uh, before we, we got uh, uh, hit. And uh, uh, we, that was not a severe thing. We, we uh, fought, fought off. We had some kids wounded, but nothing real serious. Uh, the most notable was the uh, radio telephone operator for a forward observer party, and he was. They jumped into a foxhole, and he was on the top. And as an RPG went up off in the trees above him, a shrapnel caught him, and the the only part sticking out. It, it, it was not his, his head. Um, and it was a memorable cry when he got hit. But anyway, from then on, uh, we would be told a uh, location to move to, and it would normally be no more than uh, well, two or three clicks or kilometers from previous location. And uh, we would then initially, were, the helicopter would come out, hover above us, and unload chainsaws on, uh, on slings to get it down through the trees. And then uh, uh, various demolition stuff like uh, C4 and Dead Corps. And we were then to clear an area big enough for helicopters to land in. Uh, uh, you're in the middle of nowhere in the jungle and you don't operate chainsaws with silencers. They just don't have those. And nor do you have sil silencers when you explode that cord in C4. Uh, we found out shortly that the uh, uh, chainsaws would become dull uh, on the teak trees and other hardwoods within no more than 15 minutes of operation. So we just didn't ask for those. We just asked for more C4 and dead cord. And we got pretty adept at blowing down some pretty big trees using that. Uh, but again, that makes a pretty big ba uh, boom. So the bad guys knew exactly where we were on a continuous basis. Uh, when I left on the, when I took the company on the, uh, on the air, air assault from the eastern side to the western side, uh, we probably had a foxhole strength. In other words, number of people with us on the ground. Uh, somewhere between uh, 120 and 135. I don't know the exact count. Um, after we had uh, been out there for a little, little bit over a month uh, making these various uh, landing zones, uh, I specifically requested to have my, my company withdrawn back for refit and uh, whatever. And at that point, uh, counting my headquarters uh, section, we had uh, less than 50 people. Um, all of those two were not killed by any stretch. We had people that uh, went in from um, uh, for R and R. They went in for various administrative uh, reasons. You had people who were actually 
going on D-Rose, going back home. Uh, you had medical issues, you had uh, guys with broken ankles, legs, whatever. Uh, and uh, you, you had people that just couldn't function for whatever reason. Uh, but during that time, uh, to have a company operating as less than 50 people, that was basically not more than a reinforced platoon. Uh, and I did lose a lot of people, and it was not a fun time. Uh, I do remember one specific instance where uh, I had a young troop who had, I'm not sure how long he had been with us, but we had, uh, we're, we were hit by a uh, uh, incoming fire, uh, small arms and RPGs, and um, we had uh, uh, air support uh, coming in our support and they were dropping a napalm on top of the hill. And uh, this kid uh, was basically cowering behind a tree, not ready to move, and he wouldn't move. And uh, he still, can, if he's still alive, and I don't know if he is or not, but he can still probably feel the imprint of my number nine and a half boot in order to get him out of there, because uh, I wasn't gonna leave him behind. That was my only choice, either get him going uh, or leave him behind. I decided to get him going. Uh, also had uh, a case where uh, during an assault had uh, one troop, and I think he was Puerto Rican, but I'm not sure. Uh, he got uh, hit by small arms and he had a hole, and I want to say it was in his left side, but it was big enough, and there was skin around it where I could put my fist through the hole. And we put him on the helicopter. We were certain that that was his last days. And uh, not too many months after, we got a postcard from him saying that he was recuperating back in the United States. But we also uh, lost our, our de definitely more than what we wanted to during that time. So that, that was not fun. Um, one of those times, we also had uh, the Air Force at uh, Captain Felder who had been the S-4, he'd been given a company. And he asked if he could go out with one of the other companies for a little uh, introduction, so to speak, a refresher course. And uh, he chose to come out with mine, and he did. And uh, uh, during one of the times that he was out with me, uh, we got a, we were actually climbing up on the, uh, that western side of the mountain, and the uh, western side of the valley, I should say. And we ran across a trail, and the, my lead platoon apparently got in the middle of a small inf infiltration group. And so they, when they got uh, got up there, they got, had people on both sides of them and started firing. And uh, we all you know, clambered up the, the side of the hill as best we could. And when I got up there, uh, off to my left, I saw a uh, NBA pointing, uh, sighting down his weapon at me. And I did the same, the same at him, and I shot, I think, before he did, and he definitely didn't hit me, and I don't know if I hit him or not. I don't know. But uh, we had, uh, I think we had uh, uh, three uh, NVA KIA, one of them which was an officer, and we had, had got their stuff and a fair amount of intel that we sent back. And uh, Vince Felder was uh, with me at, at that point. Um, also on that side of the valley, we were right on the border of Laos and Vietnam, South Vietnam. And uh, we could look over into Laos and we could see what was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, and we were not allowed to fire over there, nor were we allowed to direct fire over there. And we had, uh, we, we could uh, tell how many trucks were coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail because we could count the lights and divide by two, figure that that would be the number of trucks. And uh, that, that's sort of a sad situation. You, you knew that they were bringing supplies down to hit you with, but you couldn't do anything about it. Uh, we also had instances uh, during that outing where uh, our net was obviously inter intercepted by the bad guys who spoke uh, English about as good as I did. Because uh, you know, they would get on, on your net and start talking to you about something, and you tried to get information from them as to who they were, and you know, no, 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 no call signs, etc. 
start asking some uh, American type questions and they didn't wouldn't know the answer wouldn't wouldn't give an answer so we're pretty sure that that was intercepted the uh, another interesting thing that we had and uh, I actually saw a uh, black painted MiG flying down the Ashaw Valley as did many other people and that was one of those that you just weren't allowed to it was supposed to have gone anywhere. It's not, never supposed to have been there. It was obviously there on, on a recon. But uh, MiGs were supposedly never in South Vietnam. I beg to differ. You know, we, we saw that one. Uh, the, um, uh, after uh, I got retrofitted, company got brought back up some, uh, we stayed more in the uh, lowlands then back in the ash out, the uh, Hamburger Hill thing was over. The one at first, for the most part, pulled out of the ash out. Um, and uh, we had a case uh, back then, uh, or around that same time, where the brigade commander that I had mentioned, Colonel Conway, was relieved, uh, which tells both the good and the bad of uh, the senior officer corps in Vietnam at that point. Um, uh, my uh, Jim Womble, A Company commander, had uh, been around the Piedmont area quite a bit, and uh, uh, on a repetitive basis, he would have uh, a sniper shoot at him, and he tried to attack and go after him, and they would have um, booby traps set up along the various trails, and uh, he lost, uh, I don't know, uh, four, five, six guys in a two-week period. And um, uh, then he went back to the battalion commander and said, uh, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to go chase after him and lose people. And the battalion commander okayed it. And the uh, uh, next time it happened, it, you know, we were all on that battalion net, so we heard what happened. But uh, he called, reported the, the incoming fire, and told battalion commander what he was going to do, how he was going to react. And the uh, battalion commander was about to give the okay, but at which time Colonel Conmey uh, came in on the net. And I think his name's uh, call sign was Iron Raven, but I'm not positive. Uh, but he came in on the net, and he said, "I don't give a shit what or how many you lose. I want some effing bot body count, quote unquote, over the battalion and brigade radio net." Well, it so happened that that. And that was also listened to by the division um, uh, deputy command for operations, uh, General Smith. Uh, and his call sign was Silver, Silver Eagle. And the next we heard over the radio net was Iron Raven, this is Silver Eagle, report to my location, ASAP. And Iron Raven uh, uh, said, Roger, out. And we never saw Colonel Kami again. He was relieved on the spot, that statement. So, you know, I fault, obviously, Colonel Conway for what he did, and I praise General Smith for the immediate relief. So, you know, so both sides of it. The uh, sad thing that I saw later on was that, uh, based upon his old guard experience, etc., uh, Colonel Conway has a building, I think it's Stables, uh, and dedicated to his name at, uh, at Third Guard headquarters at uh, Fort Myers. Um, so that, that was not one of my pleasing observations when I saw that. Uh, in, um, I guess it was uh, September, uh, I'd had my about six months, and I, I went back from a company command to become the S-1 again until I left in, uh, in uh, uh, December. And when I... Uh, there, there are many other stories that I, I can't tell about while I was company commander and, and platoon leader, etc. Uh, I think the fact that uh, what, what I look at in Vietnam and combat is sort of uh, what I've heard said many times about combat. Uh, being in combat is uh, uh, long periods of boredom uh, interrupted by uh, small minutes of intense 
uh, frustration, combat, chaos, whatever you'd like to call it. And uh, I would say over the uh, two, uh, probably 18 months that I was in some uh, leadership position as a platoon leader or a company commander, uh, I probably had oh, no more than uh, a total of 10 days that I could say I was in real combat, uh, where there were firefights involved. Uh, and uh, none of those times were good times. Uh, I, I, I was fortunate in that I only lost one soldier on my first tour in Vietnam. I uh, lost uh, somewhere around 14 to 20 on my second tour. I don't know the exact amount, uh, but uh, I don't cherish the memory of losing any of them any time. The first one I lost, I lost him, uh, he died in my arms. Uh, others, by company command, I wasn't quite as, as close to. Uh, with the one of first, uh, uh, one thing for the record, so to speak, when I came in, in and became the S-1, all of our stationery and all of our folders, et cetera, said the 101st Air Mobile Division, as that had just been directed by MACV to be a big change, or by Department of the Army or something. Well, General Westmoreland had been the uh, commander of the 101st way back when, and he apparently said, no way in hell over my dead body. And it was changed back, so less than two weeks after I came in, we got all the stuff back where it says one of first airborne division, parenthesis, air mobile. And that is now still the one of first airborne division, parenthesis, air assault. But it will never lose the official title of one of first airborne division. Um, and uh, that is the only good thing I have to say about General Westmoreland. Uh, I will add that uh, when I went through advanced course after Vietnam, uh, General Westmoreland was the Army Chief of Staff, and he came to Fort Benning to give a speech that uh, we would normally have a speech every uh, Wednesday afternoon, uh, Wednesday morning. And the students refer to this as a Wednesday morning sleeper program. But uh, with the Chief of Staff in there, obviously you can sleep, but. He came in, would uh, get polite applause, whatever, when he came in. And uh, during his speech, uh, he made the statement, and, I, and many others were in the audience at the time, said, any officer in the Army that does not have a degree is crud, quote, unquote. You figured there were at least a thousand captains in there, plus there were numerous uh, staff and faculty from the infantry school in there uh, that had, uh, were OCS grads. Uh, you did not have to have a degree to, to get a commission from OCS. Uh, you, I believe you do now, but you did not back then. When uh, he got off the stage and as he was exiting the auditorium, he was hissed by the populace of that hall. And for a bunch of officers to hiss the Army Chief of Staff is pretty traumatic. Uh, I'd also had uh, opportunities to meet Westmoreland in Vietnam. Uh, on both tours, and he was uh, likewise uh, looked at at that point. Uh, he was not the, a troop commander. The troops did not like him. Soldiers didn't like him. The officers didn't like him. Um, uh, and I also need to bring up my second, if you will, company uh, or a battalion commander that in Vietnam on my second tour was uh, um, uh, Colonel Len Hanawald. Lieutenant Colonel Len Hanawal, and he came into the battalion with, uh, he had uh, a reputation of being a future chief, Army Chief of Staff type, and he was just uh, a fantastic battalion commander. He uh, would spend maybe uh, one day a week, if that much, back at battalion headquarters. The rest of the time he was in the field with the companies, with his troops. Uh, he ended up getting killed for a somewhat careless mistake, uh, and uh, however, he is still held in very, very high regard, and the comments on uh, the virtual wall reflect that by the pe people who made contact on him. I make, made comments on there, so have others, and uh, uh, I 
been in contact with his daughter, who greatly appreciated him. Uh, he was just a very, very fine commander. Uh, so that that's a point I really want to get in. Um, there are other commanders I've served with in, on active duty that I thought very highly of, and there's people that I served with later on that I thought highly of. After I returned from Vietnam, uh, I spent approximately a year as a uh, advisor to the reserve uh, units in Oklahoma City. Um, and as a captain, I was the advisor to three full colonels, a lieutenant colonel, and a first lieutenant. So the only one that I, uh, I could re uh, would really be, had to take my, my input was the first lieutenant. But I, I got to know uh, all of it real well. Um, I then applied to uh, uh, Airborne and Ranger School, uh, and I got orders for both. Uh, about that same time, my wife became pregnant, uh, and uh, she had previously, uh, while I was at Fort Carson, had three miscarriages. So the doctor, I, we went to the doctor together and said, to, "Well, what do you think?" He said, "Well, why don't you go ahead and go to Airborne School?" and let's see how she holds up, and then come back and let's talk about it. I went through airborne school uh, as an overweight, smoking captain that had not done much exercising, and, and I became the class leader because I was a senior guy in the class. That was an experience. Um, and then came back, and uh, he said, if you want a baby, uh, you ought to stay with her. So uh, I called uh, DIA and ended up being taken off uh, going to uh, Ranger School at that point, and instead went directly to uh, the FD Officer Advanced Course for Benning. I stayed there, uh, and, and I guess I started that probably in March, and sometime around um, September, October, we had the uh, uh, representatives from our FD branch come down and talk to us and give us career counseling, etc. And uh, I, I told the major I was talking to, said to so um, uh, looking at Vietnam going down, what do you think my chances are of staying in the Army if they have a reduction in force? And he went through all my records and said, ah, no problem. About a month and a half later, I received this nice letter from the Department of the Army saying, welcome, you are, uh, w will be affected by the Department of the Army Board, which basically being called in a reduction in force. So uh, uh, I was placed into a uh, holding group, if you will, uh, 931st Engineer Command at Fort Benning, or group at Fort Benning, and I worked at the infantry board down there. And uh, I left the Army uh, active duty on the uh, 2nd of May, 1972, uh, having been accepted to uh, the University of Texas at Arlington, and having put money down on the house out there, and having established uh, various things, having gone on leave out there to get that, all that established. However, on the, uh, I think it was the 30th of April, 29th to 30th of April, I got called into the uh, G1 office at the infantry board, and they had a twix from the Department of the Army saying, your reclama has been accepted. You do not have to leave. Okay. So I got on the phone again with the infantry branch and said, okay, so what happens if we have another board? And they said, well, you have probably a little bit better than a 50-50 chance. And I said, well, if it's that close, I think I'm just going to get out and get my degree, which is what I did. Um, I got a degree in a, uh, a little bit over 18 months from the University of Texas at Arlington, having, uh, having attended numerous schools part-time in various places. Uh, while I was there, I joined the Texas National Guard. Again, I was captain commander of uh, Bravo Company, uh, 143rd Infantry, 1st of 143rd Infantry, uh, Airborne. Uh, last Airborne Brigade in the uh, reserve component structure. At that point, it was the 30, uh, 71st Airborne Brigade, changed to become 36th Airborne Brigade. Uh, as I'd gone through Airborne School not too long before that, my uh, cherry jump was in Puerto Rico uh, on a Muta 7. Uh, multiple unit tra training assembly for seven four-hour periods. Flew out of Dallas Naval Air Station, 
stop somewhere in Florida en route. We were flying in C 130 A models. Very slow and very noisy. Uh, from Sun National Guard uh, Air Unit. And um, stayed at Ramey Air Force Base overnight. Uh, flew in the next morning and jumped on the south side of Puerto Rico at a, a naval facility down there. Uh, and came back to uh, Dallas uh, the following day, again on C-130A models. Ooh, they're awful. Uh, I graduated from college, uh, went to Rhode Island, uh, stayed in, uh, uh, in Rhode Island for about a year. While there, I joined the reserves up there, 76th Brigade in uh, Rhode Island, and then uh, the, the company I work for owns Corning Fiberglass, transferred me back to Texas, to Conroe, Texas. Uh, and in, in uh, Conroe, I was working a rotating shift and therefore did not seek to get back or continue in, in reserves or a guard. Uh, however, after a year and a half to two years of that, uh, uh, I, I left Owens Corning uh, by mutual consent. Uh, they didn't have a personnel job for me and I didn't have, didn't want to go to stay in production, which is what I was in. And I concurrently received a letter from uh, uh, Reserve Component Administration Center saying that uh, you either need to do something or resign your commission. So I decided to look for a unit and I found a unit called the 75th Maneuver Area Command in Houston and uh, I joined them in the uh, early part of 1977 and uh, uh, stayed with the 75th until I transferred to Atlanta uh, with uh, in my civilian job in uh, 1988, and uh, th then in 88, or actually in the beginning of 89, I joined uh, Forces Command as uh, an intelligence officer with the Force Com Augmentation Unit, and uh, I just seemed to hit things real correctly out there because uh, after less than a year of that, I came up for a uh, colonel. And I was promoted, and uh, I was promoted by the board, selected by the board for promotion. And at the same time, the commander of the Fort Com Augmentation Unit was selected for uh, a uh, individual uh, mobilization augmentee, a brig brigadier general position. And uh, so he was leaving. So I was then selected as the commander of the Fort Com Augmentation Unit, uh, which was a, a, a colonel command. And um, uh, I had been in that, uh, I had not yet actually been promoted to uh, 06 uh, when um, Saddam Hussein decided to go into Kuwait and the unit was activated. Uh, and so I was activated for a little bit over nine months. Uh, our, my unit was the first unit activated by Forcecom as uh, we were there to uh, help Forcecom uh, fulfill its mission during activation, and uh, I stayed stayed with them, uh, uh, activated I think until May the following um, uh, year, that which would have been ninety one, and uh, stayed in command until ninety three, and then I still had a little bit of time left, and my last three years before I hit my mandatory removal date. I was the uh, uh, individual mobilization augmentee to uh, Ninth Corps in Japan, uh, where we would go to Japan to Camp Sama for three weeks a year and uh, conduct a uh, uh, basically a command post exercise. Uh, I don't recall the name of it, uh, but uh, that was just a great way to go out. I thoroughly enjoyed going over there for three weeks a year. Camp Sama was great. Uh, my uh, job function over there was uh, secretary to general staff, which uh, no one knew what to do with an 06 in that position because a normal person was a major. Uh, it would only be an 06 position in case of activation. So, but I had a very good sergeant major, a uh, retired sergeant major who ran the uh, SGS shop. So I let him do his thing and I became the uh, assistant uh, uh, and deputy commander, whatever I'm saying. But thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I retired in uh, 
uh, March 1996 with my uh, official um, uh, retirement ceremony conducted at the 75th Maneuver Area Command in Houston, Texas uh, that I'd served with for some time and the person who uh, actually presided over my retirement was a previous uh, protege of mine who ended up uh, being promoted to a, a Brigadier General at the same time that uh, I retired. And it was Perry Dalby, and who later retired as Major General. So that's the my Army career. Well, that's that's colorful, interesting uh, career. We appreciate you sharing it with us. But after all that, I mean, you've you've spent a lot of time in the Army and in a variety of different things. Are there any comments in general that uh, you would like to make about uh, your perspective on life in the Army, life in general, or life in the future? Well, one thing I uh, did not add in the middle of all this, uh, I, got, I, I was divorced in uh, 1981, and uh, I, subsequently in 1984 I married a young lady who I'd met in the reserves in Houston in 75th Maneuver Area Command. And uh, uh, with my first marriage, I had two daughters, and uh, they are now uh, 45 and 40. And uh, with my, on my second marriage, we have a son who is now 25. Uh, my wife stayed in the reserves as well, and she retired as a full colonel also. And, uh, it, that was actually a little gutsy of uh, dating of me because her dad was the commander of the 75th Maneuver Air <laughs> Command as a uh, two-star general. Uh, he promoted me to uh, a major. Uh, he was a one-star at the time. At that point, I didn't know her, didn't know that they were even related. Uh, just, just, uh, he just happened to be the one who promoted me at that point. And I have a picture of that. And that was, uh, my hair was even longer than it is right now. That was the Bolar days in the, in the Army Reserves. You know. But uh, I, since then, uh, uh, obviously I'm very proud of my wife for having made 06. And, uh, very proud of uh, my father-in-law and uh, that whole, the whole side of the family. So, uh, well, what occupies your time now that you're retired? Uh, going to interviews. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many of them. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, uh, I t a lot of projects at the house. I play golf some. Uh, and my wife is uh, retiring probably this year, and we will be doing more traveling. Uh, we have a trip uh, laid out here shortly uh, to go to Europe, uh, see grandkids. I have uh, two grandkids that live less than an hour away. I have another one that uh, lives in Texas that I don't get to see as often. Uh, my wife and I are fer fairly ardent uh, LSU Tiger fans. We have season tickets and uh, drive to Baton Rouge at least seven times every fall. Um, and that, that's only about an eight hour drive each way. Uh, but, so we, we enjoy that. Uh, uh, and uh, when my wife's home, I work on, under adult supervision, uh, uh, doing gardening and replanting trees. and. And mo moving plants. Uh, okay. No, I'm doing well. Okay. Appreciate it. Well, once again, thank you for your time and thank you for your service. I mean, that was uh, quite an investment in the country that you made, in our country and, and, and that, that you made. So uh, thank you and uh, good luck. Well, th thank you for taking the time to not only interview me, but to be a big part of the Veterans History Project and, and the, the Library of Congress project. Well, we appreciate it. Okay.